Uh, good afternoon. My name is Amar Akhtar. So I run the product management team here at VMware for SASE and security services. So happy to be here to talk about the uh, technical aspects of the VMware SASE offering. Now, as Carl was talking about, what we've built um, with VMware SASE is really pulling together a number of different capabilities that is delivered partially on-prem as well as within the cloud. So on-prem, of course, we have footprints with remote access, uh, you know, clients running on perhaps on people's laptops, but we also have the classical uh, branch router with what we call the VCE. So this is the branch router and it's able to, uh, you know, optimize traffic into uh, our cloud environment. And from there into the enterprise on-prem environment to an IaaS towards the SaaS or, or generally to the rest of the internet. And the idea here is that from the SASE pops, uh, we're able to deliver SD-WAN services. So improving WAN connectivity, increasing the performance of it. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, we recently launched uh, a new offer called VMware Secure Access. So this is our zero trust offering. And uh, the first set of use cases are actually around remote access. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. And then uh, there's also cloud web security. So this is our SWIG offering that initially is able to do uh, decryption of traffic as, uh, as enterprise traffic exits out towards the internet. And it's also able to do anti-malware and URL filtering. Uh, and then finally, there is also edge network intelligence. Now edge network intelligence is an AI ops platform. Uh, it is integrated into the SD-WAN environment uh, but it can also operate independently of it. And really what that's about is getting an idea of what is going on with the user's network experience as they make use of enterprise resources or they're uh, connecting over to you know, SaaS applications and the like, and, and really accelerating both for the user self-remediation in case of challenges, but also for the IT teams to be able to help that user get back and, and be productive. Now, looking at it from a from a zero trust perspective, this is an end to end zero trust system uh, at various stages. And the idea with zero trust here is that we're able to take a look at identity. We're able to marry that together with an assessment of risk. And based on that, we're able to do a level of enforcement. So, for example, if you are not at a particular patch level on your laptop, we can either disallow you access or provide you a limited narrow band of access. In the past, this would have been just a quarantine, but we can you know, allow you to go perhaps just to your cafeteria menu or to a few other places, depending on the risk that your environment itself might pose to yourself and, and towards uh, the, the rest of the enterprise in of itself. Um, the, as Carl mentioned, our vision here is actually to bring everything together into a single UI, whether you are uh, coming in it from a network perspective or from a security perspective uh, and, you know, uh, in, in this new future, these policies are actually coming together, especially because of the way distribution of, of, of how work is distributed, where people are, and they are coming in over the WAN. It's very easy to bypass your traditional firewall if that's what people wanted to do, if that firewall was sitting inside the data center and your app is sitting somewhere within the cloud, like a SaaS environment. Uh, so it is important that network and security policies are, are tied at the hip. And Part of the reasons for SASE and part of the reasons for us to be able to do this in a single UI um, uh, follow those same uh, trends that are happening. Uh, now, I, with respect to secure access in of itself, uh, as I mentioned before, this is a zero trust offering uh, and the first set of use cases is around uh, remote access. So what we have available today are two form factors. One is a little bit non-traditional if you're familiar with remote access is that we actually incorporate this into um, a device management system. So if you're familiar with Workspace ONE from VMware, uh, formerly known as AirWatch, uh, um, we're able to uh, manage the device in terms of OS, app upgrades, uh, you know, directory services, these types of things. Uh, it covers uh, you know, Android, Apple iOS, uh, Mac OS, as well as Windows. And in built into that environment is this always on zero trust remote access capability that brings that traffic into one of our 52 pops that uh, are in the process of being rolled out. So, uh, so Carl showed the, uh, the, the schedule of the pops uh, in, the, in the previous set of slides. Now, in a more traditional remote access environment, we also offer that same stack from a, 
uh, from a tunneling and from a zero trust and from a remote access standpoint as a standalone offering. So think about BYOD, think about contractors who may uh, be a little bit uneasy with their device being managed uh, by the IT organization. So there's also available secure access as a standalone offering. What we're working on is a clientless offering, meaning that you don't have to install uh, the software uh, uh, on, onto your device. And you really just wind up using your web browser, whether that be Netscape or Mozilla or uh, you know, somewhere from a, from a bygone era. All you need is a browser and that browser allows you to connect into uh, our environment and from there, uh, you're able to uh, connect into uh, perhaps uh, a web-based app that you're hosting inside your data center or under an IaaS environment. Finally, uh, something else that's a little bit unique to us because we do, uh, VMware does have a huge install base with respect to Horizon. So we are working on enabling Horizon VDI termination. This is just the outer layer, not the compute resources into our SASE pops. And once that traffic terminates into our SASE pop, the idea here is that it's low latency connection into the SASE pop. And then from there, uh, we can backhaul the traffic to your IaaS environment or to your data center environment, wherever that VDI host itself is hosted. Now, looking at the larger SD-WAN system in and of itself, this is all about connectivity and making connectivity super easy. So whether you're going over to a SaaS cloud uh, you know, like Office 365 or Zoom, we are actually able to improve the experiences uh, by way of uh, a technology called DMPO, Dynamic Multipath Optimization. Uh, we're able to do things like uh, uh, you know, a single packet loss recovery, uh, switch over to alternate links uh, within, uh, within sub seconds. These types of things allow us to be able to not only improve the performance, but also the resilience of these, of these applications and keep people productive. Um, a little bit different from us is the multi-cloud connectivity model that we have because we have cloud-based gateways. So we have uh, within our SASE pops the ability to uh, aggregate and terminate the traffic, whether that's coming from remote access or it's coming from the branch environments or from the home environments. And from there, we're able to aggregate that traffic and bring that into the IaaS environment. So connecting from our cloud gateways into, for example, an AWS TGW or an Azure uh, VPN gateway. And then finally, if your intention is actually to bring that traffic uh, you know, down to your data center, of course, that is there as well. And we're able to do that both for remote access, work for, uh, the work from home environments, but also from your branch environments where you know, from the cloud gateways themselves, or if there's a need to do lower latency uh, traversal, uh, you're able to do that directly from the home into, uh, I'm sorry, uh, directly from the branch environments into the data center. And that could actually include your home as well. Um, and, and that gives you a high, higher speed a lower latency path because it's not going through uh, uh, sort of this uh, other anchoring point. Now talking a little bit about the performance in of itself. So this is a uh, test results that we've done, uh, uh, you know, with Zoom, but also with Microsoft 365. In fact, Zoom's uh, technical team and their, uh, their architecture team really was very impressed with the performance that you could do on top of uh, the Zoom improvements for video conferencing in and of itself. So Zoom is very aware that it runs on, you know, the WAN network and that WAN network has reliability issues and things of that nature. So, you know, from their perspective, they've actually done quite a bit of work to try to, you know, eke out greater performance from your WAN network in and of itself. Now, coupling that already optimized Zoom network application with DMPO from uh, from VMware SD-WAN, we're actually able to take what used to be an SD-WAN session uh, into an, eight, I'm sorry, an SD session into an HD session. Uh, for example, taking from SD to over to 720p, and you're actually able to also reduce the CPU load on the laptop itself, right? Because the thing you have to remember is that work that the Zoom app has to do in terms of improving that network performance uh, does tax the laptop CPU. So by offloading some of these things onto uh, the SD-WAN appliance, we're able to free up uh, CPU cycles on the laptop. So you actually have a better experience in terms of productivity and 
at the slide share that I'm doing right now, but also you actually get better quality as well. In this case, moving from SD to an HD uh, experience. Uh, in the case of Office 365, uh, I believe we did this with SharePoint and OneDrive. Uh, we're able to improve the, you know, the performance of that data transfer by, by an order of 10. And that goes through all the sort of you know, network optimizations that, that we do within SD-WAN to be able to do these types of things. <clears throat> now, uh, we talked about secure access. So again, that is our zero trust remote access offering. We talked a little bit about SD-WAN. So that's kind of where we started with, it, with VMware SD-WAN. Um, in the June timeframe, we also released a new capability. It's a new offer called, called Cloud Web Security, CWS. And this is essentially a SWIG a secure web gateway that is delivered out of our SASE POPs in of itself. So whether you're coming in through remote access or you're coming in through uh, the VCE, which is our branch router, we're able to offer uh, uh, the cloud web security services. Now these services include the ability to be able to decrypt this traffic, to be able to apply URL filterings. And sometimes I call this the you know parental control for the enterprise. So for example, you're able to take HR people and uh, prevent them from going to gambling websites, or if they do go to gambling websites, to be able to audit and visualize, uh, generate reports uh, about that type of stuff. Um, another capability is anti-malware and sandbox, and we're able to, uh, you know, understand the binaries that are coming into your device, uh, into the enterprise, whether they pose a threat, whether they be spyware or ransomware or these types of things. And even if there's zero day threats, we're able to pull those off to the side throw them into a sandbox in our cloud environment and determine that they are or are not a threat uh, to the enterprise in of itself. Uh, what's coming down the pike over the next uh, couple of months is CASB. So this is inline CASB. Uh, we're able to uh, audit user actions against SaaS-based applications, uh, as well as do enforcement uh, against those SaaS applications. So again, just taking that HR example again, let's say, uh, you don't want HR people to upload pictures onto Facebook. So that is uh, probably a control that Facebook does not offer uh, to their enterprise customers, but it is something that we can impose onto the path through our CASB environment. So that'll be coming out in the next couple of months. And then DLP uh, is uh, looking for specific patterns. So think about credit card numbers, social security numbers, HIPAA data making its way. I, I realize there's a couple of people from Canada that are on the call. So the HIPAA data may not be, you have a, a relevant uh, local regulation in that area. Uh, so we're able to recognize these patterns as well as custom patterns created by the enterprise. And as we uh, you know, inspect the traffic that's going out, we're able to prevent that those data packets from leaving the enterprise in of itself. So think about the case of, you know, the employee that tries to save like a, a spreadsheet onto their public Dropbox and we're able to catch those and we're able to prevent those from, from leaving the enterprise in of itself. I talked earlier about ENI. So ENI is our AI, AI ops platform. And really there's a number of different things that um, e and I does at the end of the day, but it, it's important to understand how it does it. And that sort of gives you an idea of the power of the data that it actually has. So e and I is able to do, uh, it's able to gather data by connecting to a number of different, let's say information bases, and it can actually generate information by itself. Uh, so e and I is able to look at the traffic that's on the wire. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, promiscuously, it can actually look at the traffic that's going through our branch router, through the VCE, and it can generate information uh, based on that, this type of traffic, this user, those types of things. It can also connect to, for example, wireless LAN controllers and gather data about who's logged into this particular AP, uh, what RF they're on, any kind of RSSI information, these types of things. It can go and talk to your AAA server. It can go and talk to your Skype business environment that's local. And really what it's trying to do is piece together a composite picture of what that user, what that device uh, is experiencing, whether it be slow DNS requests, failures in DHCP, uh, you know, poor RSSI from a, a Wi-Fi perspective, uh, it is able to do uh, device fingerprinting. So if you have, for example, a blood pressure monitor or a printer uh, or a video conferencing system, uh, it's able to understand uh, that this is this type of device and it's able to baseline you know, uh, that device, whether it be an IoT device or whether it be your laptop. And from there, it's able to generate reports for your IT folks in terms of troubleshooting that this is uh, 
this is the usual sort of performance for this user. This is uh, uh, an anomaly in terms of DNS responses and, and these types of things. And then finally, uh, because it is collecting this data across hundreds of thousands of customers, it's actually able to look at trends in terms of you know, uh, OS versions, in terms of in uh, perhaps the healthcare industry, here is, here is a normal uh, uh, set of uh, you know, RSSI failures, those types of things. So you as an administrator, within one of these industries, you can see how you're doing benchmarking wise against your, uh, against your peers. Now, uh, pulling all this stuff together, we talked about um, the uh, observability that ENI offers and the actual active uh, controls that SD-WAN offers in terms of performance. We're able to move traffic back and forth between different links. We're able to recover from packet loss. We're able to do super easy QoS. We you know, identify thousands of applications and we have pre-configured QoS policies. Of course, these are uh, can be overridden. Uh, we have a zero trust system uh, that's built in into our remote access environment. We're expanding that into the on-prem environment. But the basic idea over here is that this is an end-to-end -end, uh, interface that we have all the way down potentially into your end device, into your laptop, uh, potentially starting at the, uh, the branch router and carrying this all the way through, through our POPs, all over to the egress, whether that be a branch router or all the way into a SaaS environment through our CASB offering as well. Uh, we didn't really cover this very, uh, uh, very much, but, uh, you know, we've run into cases where, you know, uh, during the COVID environment where within nine days, we were able to deploy 9,000 uh, uh, SD-WAN uh, appliances uh, and in homes. And, and, and from an IT perspective, this actually was done in such a way that there was a negligible <laughs> impact to, you know, open cases and, and things of that nature. Uh, it, it was a very, uh, uh, so the customers were very surprised and very excited about the opportunities in, in those cases. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Carl sort of touched a little bit on this is that we are definitely, you know, based in the cloud, but we're also extremely open. We do have a number of different services that we deliver out of VMware SD-WAN and VMware SASE, but it's a pick and choose. You can choose to use a third party SWIG. You can choose uh, to use ours, uh, you know, if you want the integrated experience and uh, the single GUI experience, but it, it's, we leave this open and we understand that people are in different stages of, of moving from on-prem into the cloud in and of itself. So uh, the idea over here with the openness is actually to give the power to the customer to be able to pick and choose and to move at their own rate. Uh, into this uh, into this new world of cloud delivered security and cloud delivered applications and 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 SaaS and uh, IaaS environments. Now, uh, it's your traditional sort of uh, you know billboard of, of customers, but each one of these customers actually has a, a really powerful story behind it. So, for example, at MD Anderson, we helped them. Uh, we helped their radiologists actually uh, during the COVID crisis by installing SD-WAN environments in their home. And radiologists are familiar with their work. They pull down these radiographs at a very, very high rate. And the ability to be able to look at these, um, you know, uh, if, it, if your network isn't that great, you're not going to be able to look at these very quickly. So having an SD-WAN that's actually very performant and very reliable allows um, uh, you know, the, the radiologists to be able to continue their, their work in, 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 in the, in sort of doing the COVID crisis in of itself. Uh, there's other cases, for example, you know, we're working with uh, kinder care, uh, which is a, a daycare type environment and to be able to provide access into, uh, for parents to, into the, into the home environment, not the home environments, but into the, <laughs> and into their kids' environments to be able to do uh, and, and, and watch kids and things of that nature. But uh, really, really exciting customers um, we've got references for many of them, but each one of these actually has uh, a very sort of compelling business case that we've, uh, you know, worked with them to try to be able to address and solve as they themselves, uh, either they're doing some work from home type thing, or they're doing a convergence into the cloud, or they're just trying to do, you know, lots of deployments very, very quickly. Now, the other side of this is that, you know, through the different uh, lenses that we look at at VMware SASE and VMware SD-WAN is that, you know, we're doing work with, with individual service providers. You can purchase, of course, uh, you know, VMware uh, SASE through 
uh, uh, so through uh, various telcos. We've got deep relationships, for example, with Teladoc and Zoom. In fact, we do direct peerings uh, from our SD-WAN environments, from our SASE pops into, into UC environments like Ring Central. Uh, so through each one of these different sort of, uh, you know, B2B engagements, there is a story over there as well in terms of how do we integrate into these sort of clouds of cloud, cloud of cloud environments, uh, whether they be uh, in the healthcare space, they be in the U in the U in the unified communication space, or they be in the security space. And in some cases, you know, they're perhaps our competitors in one environment, and they're partners uh, of ours in other environments. Uh, that's kind of all I have. Uh, thank you, folks. I uh, would love to take any questions. Hi, Amir. Scott Bollinger. Um, I had a question. As you were drilling down into the uh, SASE services, it seems like there could be, um, I mean, I appreciate the modular approach, but it seems like there could be some overlap with some of your other offerings like uh, Carbon Black. Um, it, are we leveraging any of the technologies from, from that side into, into this, or is this all totally different technology? Yeah, so Carbon Black is an EDR, really good question. So an EDR is going to be doing, I'm going to simplify this really much, <laughs> so, so just excuse me, it's like a next generation antivirus system on your end system at the end of the day. So CWS, one of the functions that CWS is, is anti-malware or antivirus, right? But an EDR is sitting on your end system and um, uh, CWS anti-malware, of course, CWS has other capabilities, is a network service at the end of the day. Um, a, they are complementary in that um, you, because of zero trust, Carbon Black is able to convey that there's greater risk on this particular laptop because of the actions that were seen and malware that were seen. And that actually narrows your application aperture, right? The other way of looking at this also is that CWS is this very large blanket of protection for people that may or may not have EDR installed. So mm -hmm. think about guest users in a retail environment. Uh, you know, EDR almost always implies that it's a managed device of some sort, right? But that's not always the case. You may have contractors, you may have BYOD type situations, you may have guest users. And CWS is able to sort of carry that entire thing. Um, uh, the final thing to sort of think about is an EDR is ultimately your last line of defense. And generally in security, you want to have more than one line of defense. Like if that, and then, you know, the EDR sitting on the laptop, it's watching the process do what it's doing. And if it sort of goes out, that sort of, let's call it a jail, uh, it will shut that guy down, right? Um, you don't want to get to that, that particular point. If you can cut this off sooner uh, at the, in the network itself, you definitely want to do that. Uh, now, the final thing about EDR, uh, I, said, I said the other thing was final, but this is the actual final, which is um, that, you know, not all network threats have, uh, not all threats have an attack vector by the network. I mean, I mean, everybody's heard the story of, you know, the social engineering thing. You, you leave a couple of USB disks in the parking lot and somebody is, in, is inevitably going to be sticking one of those USB disks in their laptop. So CWS is not going to help you. In, in that area because it's a network service. Whereas an EDR on the laptop, of course, will help you. Um, so there's so there's different domains that they play in, Scott, but we also are integrating the two together in terms of you know the EDR feeding information into the zero trust environment and what's there. Sorry, Thank I you. spoke too long about that. That's a, that's a very, very good question. So it's very timely. Thank you. Hey, Mayor, Chris Gundeman here. Um, I have a question around just the interactions between um, the secure access and the SD-WAN, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm, let's say I'm running my laptop and I'm using the secure access agent on that laptop and, um, you know, I move into a branch office, right? I, I go, I'm working mm -hmm. in the coffee shop in the morning, I work in the branch office in the afternoon. Is secure access smart enough to recognize that I'm now in an SD-WAN environment of the same domain and, and switch over or am I like, you know, now double encrypting my double tunneling all my traffic through both. Yeah, and actually, this is a, ultimately this is an enterprise decision today, um, and, and you see this across sort of the industry. Is it's a, and and here's where the enterprise decision is: Do they value the visibility and the performance that's afforded to that client when they're sitting in the enterprise domain, right, within the branch environment? Um, or do they value more the zero trust aspects of things and they want to sort of constrain under a single policy, uh, which also means ultimately like keeping that tunnel up and, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the cons of double encryption and, and those types of things. So uh, let me explain what's, what's being done today. So 
we are able to detect that we are in the enterprise networking domain. We do this through beacons. So we basically recognize, uh, actually, so I was told like, hey, don't use the word beacon because people think we're using BLE. We're not using BLE. <laughs> when I say beacon, we're actually, we're doing sort of a network test against well-known um, sort of, uh, uh, I want to say beacon, <laughs> well-known places within the network, right? So think of like a ping test or a TCP check. If we're able to get to that, we think we are on the network in of itself. So, uh, and, and the reason I say that is because you specifically said, are we aware of the SD1, right? We're not directly aware of the SD1. And I think that would not help in this particular area because you could be sitting in the campus environment and there may not be SD1 and stuff like that. So um, once we do that detection, it's really an enterprise administrator policy is whether we want to disable that tunnel or not, right? And that goes back to where is that trade-off in between the visibility and performance gains for running on the enterprise network versus the trueness to, uh, to the zero trust policy that was created. So what most enterprises wind up doing is basically have two dual planes of zero trust or security, one for the remote access users, and then one for the branch environments or the, or the sort of native environments themselves. That's what we are offering as well. Uh, but part of what Carl was talking about is that is our vision to actually is to bring all those things together under a single GUI and, and into a single uh, 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 policy plane as well. That makes sense. And I have kind of a follow-up question, which actually, based on your answer, I think I know what, what the answer is, but uh, I'm gonna ask it anyway. You, you know, Do you personally um, or, or, or VMware as a whole see zero trust and secure access in particular usurping SD-WAN um, overall, right? I mean, if I can put an agent on everybody's laptop, do I need to be sending devices out to every branch? Um, I guess is the question. Yeah, it's just different modes of access, right? I think there's benefits that are there with just the, you know, laptop sitting off by itself. But, you know, being in the office, there's benefits of being able to send traffic to your local laptop or being able to do you know, like MDNS to go discover the video conferencing system. And there's a whole bunch of stuff about being in a shared environment. Um, and there's differences in, you know, if you're in your home environment, do you still want to, you know, connect to your printer and things of that nature? So I think there's different sort of modes of access. And what we need to be able to do is to bring together that vision of common policy, common context sharing, regardless of your mode of access. Uh, to kind of piggyback on, on Chris, Chris's question about, you know, the, the difference between uh, an SD-WAN appliance and uh, the secure access methodology of connecting into the network. Um, you know, I kind of feel like on the WAN, the, the whole WAN remediation piece is, is pretty important. And you mentioned D DMPO, which is available on the, on the uh, um, you know, the, the VCE, the, the Bellicott Edge appliances. Um, so, you know, the question is, do you, do you expect that level of functionality, that DMPO functionality that you guys call it to be built into um, the, the client side. So from the, you know, the, the secure access client being able to leverage DMPO for, you know, forward error correction, jitter buffering, and some of the things, the cool things that you guys do today on the edge. Yeah, certainly we see, we see a lot of demand for that, those types of things. And certainly, you know, where we started with SD-WAN and the network improvements that, that, that you see over there, uh, it's, I think it's actually even more needed on laptops and these sort of devices that are, uh, I would say, you know, living in a network hostile environment, right? Like a, a, a physical appliance, you can sort of design the environment to some extent around it, but, you know, sitting at a, at a Wi-Fi uh, sort of airport lounge is you don't ha really have a whole lot of control. So you're sort of at the, uh, at the mercy of whatever the environment is over there. So certainly the demand is over there and we certainly have an interest in that area. Yep. Now that said, um, you know, there is this benefit that we do have in terms of having these multiple pops, right? And we have more than one pop in one region, if you will, right? I mean, just in on the east coast of the US, it's actually like three, at least three pops right there. And the latency between them for your regular enterprise is very, very small because they're not going to have three pops just on three data centers just on one coast, uh, if you will. So the fact that we're able to switch in between those it allows us to be able to sort of bypass uh, at least some classes of issues that, that could be happening within uh, within the internet of itself. But certainly there's actually a lot more stuff that can be done and, and uh, will be done. Uh, yeah, Jody Lemoyne here. I'm uh, just wondering how transparent is the interconnection between the data centers and the VMware SASE cloud and also the, the other clouds we're connecting to? Is that uh, a simple user-generated thing or do we have to engage VMware for that? 
what what do you mean by transparent well obviously we are we have our endpoints talking to vmware sassy now we have mm -hmm. the vmware sassy cloud talking to our data centers we have the vmware sassy cloud talking to our azure instances that sort of thing mm -hmm. the connections between vmware sassy and our data center and those cloud instances, how transparent are they? Do uh, can we just do those through the GUI with, through our own management? That's yeah. everything we have to engage people for. Yeah. So um, there's multiple different ways that you can establish those connections. Um, all of them you can do by yourself. You can do it through the UI, right? And the different ways basically amount to whether you have an SD WAN appliance, by the way, which can be a completely virtual thing. So you can run it in ESXi or you can buy the physical appliance as well. Um, or uh, you're doing an IPsec connection. So for in the case of, for uh, example, to connect to AWS, you can host a virtual appliance and you know, throw that into your VPC, or you can connect to TGW. But both of these ultimately can be driven out of the UI uh, in of itself. And in fact, um, you know, uh, for, for some of the cloud providers, we already have workflows uh, where we will actually take care of the instantiation and, and we have the, the virtual routers already in Azure and like, and you can just sort of uh, in the Azure Marketplace, sorry, and you can just sort of kick it off and we'll take care of that entire workflow for you. Yeah, speaking of options, and hopefully this is not a features question, I, 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 <laughs> but um, uh, on the, uh, again, back to kind of the, the secure access component uh, with remote access users, um, is there um, a capability today or, um, you know, maybe future uh, for multi-homing there? So, you know, connecting back to the, the SASE pops, and then maybe being able to connect back to you know some other element if, where you might have a, a, another gateway, say in the data center, to aggregate connectivity to you know give those users more direct connectivity back to data center resources versus having to you know come up through the the SASE pops for that. Yeah, so uh, they're singly home today. Um, we do have flexibility in the policy such that you can do split tunneling at multiple places, which is something that's traditionally not been available, right? So you can do split tunneling or internet breakout at the laptop itself, right? Uh, of course, you can also do a block right there. So if you don't want that user to go to a certain site, you can actually block it. You can uh, bypass it, which means sending it directly out to the internet or tunnel it, which is to bring it into the SASE pop. And then you actually have a similar set of um, decisions at the SASE pop in of itself. Like you can exit that traffic directly to the internet, you can bring it down to the enterprise, or you can you know, do greater inspections with it. And then finally, even at the data center, if that's what you want to do, you can still do those things right there as well, like exit out towards the internet and things like that. Uh, the multi-homing thing I think can be useful, especially if you are looking at network optimization type things, uh, but it's not something that we support today. So, so thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, folks. Uh, it has been really great talking to you and, and answering your questions. Have a great day.